One is known for his creativity in film and theater, and the other is known for no air. Now, if you were thinking EGOT winner Mike Nichols and R&B singer Chris Brown, well, no, not them. Mike Nichols is a critically acclaimed theater director from upstate New York, and Chris Brown is the host of the online show Cross Border Interviews and wants to thank everyone. And I'm taking a serious moment here who tuned in last month for an amazing episode where the majority of the comments weren't attacking me. Oh, was I getting attacked last week? Instead, asking if Michael was okay and if he needed help. Yes. As I am quoting here, is Michael going through a midlife crisis, end quote, to which I replied in the gay community, 30 is the new 50. So yes, he is at the end of his midlife crisis. Either way, together, Mike Nichols and Chris Brown talk about the entertainment industry as only two people who aren't the people you're thinking of only can. Michael, how are you? It's nice to know that if I just am not (laughs) sleeping very well, that the fans will be like, are, is he okay? Do we need to like put him in a fifty-one fifty? Like, yes, yes, you did. Um, no, no, y'all, I was doing too much. That's just the reality of it. I was doing too much. Um, but as Chris said, I am now critically acclaimed. The critics loved my production of Rabbit Hole that I directed. Um, they had zero issues. <laughs> just asterisks there, critic. Cr- Critic. <laughs> no, we had a couple of folks that said really positive things. We just only had one media publication, like actually print it because it was only running one weekend. So a lot of the others won't do it. We had bu- a bunch of folks from the media there that wrote lovely things on Facebook. They just didn't put it in their paper because it was a one weekend show, which sucks because if it was two weekends, I probably would have had four or five really positive, really wonderful reviews based on the number of media folks that came and wrote something on Facebook. So for those who are wondering, we're literally about two minutes into this and you're already getting the sense that Chris is back to his old self attacking Michael. Michael is back to his sort of level head itself and going to bring some civility to the show. So some class, I like to say some class. Girl, the only <laughs> class that you go to is grade two. But I'm bumped. I don't know uh, what that means. I don't either don't know it's been a long week and it's only getting started for me it's been a long month and it's only the not of whatever day we're recording this on the, the, the 15 <laughs> the, the whatever day this comes out we're recording it that day um i wanna kind of pick up with where we left off in october i know it was only two weeks ago but i want to start there and i want to ask because you actually took the time you spent your hard-earned economic dollars you took the moment and bought the book and you got the book sent to you i gotta ask the million dollar question to start this show how was britney spears's autobiography that she didn't write well, and she acknowledged she didn't write it. She fully was like, I had ghostwriters, you know who you are, but I'm not going to put you on blast because like people are psychos about my life. So like she owns it. She's, I'm not mm. going to be, all these people do it. It's when they try to pretend like they didn't that I'm like, can we calm down? Um, It was actually really good. It was not like very flowery and like all these metaphors and like she really didn't try and like make this like some overly artistic expression and she was like this is my story I'm very blunt with it and it was written like I could have believed she had written it or even they just took verbally what she said and put it on paper it was it was in her voice it was very succinct it was very exact it was pretty scathing as it went on um and that's the thing like it started out like with her family and you're like, you know, that they're kind of had a fucked up life, blah, 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 blah. But then as it kind of went on, especially getting into the conservatorship, you're like, oh, this woman's not okay. And she openly admits in the book, she's like, the conservatorship fucked my whole life up. Like, I I don't know how to function as a human and I'm not doing well. And, and like, she's very honest in it, which is fantastic. Um, she's very open about things that she fucked up on. She's open about things that, she didn't necessarily like and it it was it was an interesting take I think the biggest like moment from it was uh Justin she Justin Timberlake and her got pregnant Justin Timberlake forced her to have the abortion and then played guitar at her while she was aborting a child 
on her bathroom floor. He was he wouldn't let her go to the hospital because he didn't want anyone to know. And then he thought music would help her, so played guitar at her. Like it was that scene in Barbie where Ken is just playing guitar at Barbie. It was not a vibe. And I'm kind of happy that Justin Timberlake is getting his comeuppance because he's been a he he has been a problem. I so before this before we recorded and before you even mentioned this, I didn't know that she was writing a book. Like you were the first one to tell me. And it kind of just flew under the radar. It was released, and I didn't see a lot of publicity around it. I saw the one or two day story about Justin Timberlake and how him and Jessica Biel were all huddling and making sure that they were going to release a statement about what was in the book. But that's about it. There was no big press. Like, usually when you release a book like this, you do a big press tour. I know there's going through a lot of things in Hollywood right now, but sort of people are back and people want to probably book guests like Britney Spears. Are you shocked that it didn't make it as big as wave as people potentially like yourself or people who are listening might've thought it would have? No, I, I, I think it's making a fairly large wave. I think she's just not wanting to do a lot of media stuff. Okay. She, I mean, she even talks about it in the book that she was like hounded and harassed and like stalked by the media. So I'm, I'm thinking she just probably doesn't want to do all that. The book was selling pretty well when I walked into the Barnes and Noble to buy it. The table was filled. It was filled. And then by the time I left, it was about half filled. So people were going and buying it. I think it's the big thing is it's a tough time of year right now for the book to come out. With the holidays coming up, a lot of folks are going to put it on their Christmas list and say, just this is what I want for Christmas. And so they're not going to buy it because it's an easy, like a lot of people could read this. And even if you're not a big autobiography reader, I feel this way about The Woman and Me as I did about um, Jeanette McCurdy's autobiography that came out last year, I'm Glad My Mom Died. Um, It's a very good, easy read for folks who don't tend to like autobiographies or um, nonfiction style books because it's not necessarily written in a traditional sense. And it's a lot of times someone that is being very honest and very funny and very kind of blunt in some ways. Um, To quote uh, the host of RuPaul's Drag Race, the library is open because I, I, I actually did go through and I was trying to figure out if Britney Spears was the only autobiography that is going to be coming out in 2023 or had come out in 2023. And I'm going to read you the list of authors or celebrities who came out with memoirs or are coming out with memoirs by tw- the end of 2023. So as you said, Britney Spears, Reba McIntyre, Barbara Streisand, mm. Rebel Wilson, Hugh Jackman just announced that he is writing a, a memoir, which we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Patrick Stewart, Leslie Jones, Kerry Washington, Jada Pinkett Smith, Henry Winkler, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Paris Hilton, Kristen Chenoweth, Pamela Anderson, Elliot Page, Harry, Prince Harry, Willie Nelson, and even John Stamos. And these are just a few of the ones that I was able to find in 2023. And I've got to ask, and I kind of, this is kind of a weird question to ask on an entertainment show, but are are these 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 memoirs autobiographies if you will because i'm assuming the majority of them will be written by ghostwriters with the same way that everyone else does like prince harry's the horrible book that it was um are we seeing more celebrities doing this to sort of engage with their fan base than social media and sort of the traditional way of those fan meet and greets out in like calgary or uh, comic-con or fan expos or whatever you want to call it are books the new thing that celebrities are sort of taking interest in or are they just normal and i'm just haven't been noticing it for a long time i think it's fairly normal um but but this is a large list i think with the rise in media publications like perez hilton page six e-news tmz Mm. so many celebrities want to kind of take back their story and take back their narrative. It's you, cause especially Perez Hilton was outing everybody and was running around and kind of doing all this really fucked up shit. And then it's led to what TMZ does and what page six does. And it's, we're going to report rumors and call it fact. And, and the Perez Hiltonification of 
celebrity news is massive. And when you get an autobiography that's written by the celebrity or a ghostwriter who is sitting there and being and interviewing the celebrity for this narrative, um, it's a chance to reclaim your story. Britney Spears was reclaiming her story. Um, Paris Hilton, I'm 100% sure, sure is reclaiming her story. And I did not know that it's already out and that it came out in March. I need to go buy that because I fucking love Paris Hilton. And she's fascinating. She's another one of those celebrities that had this whole media eye personality of being this dumb blonde. And she's actually probably one of the smartest human beings. It, she That was all a character for TV because she knew that's what America wanted. And so like... I it was read the Elliot Kim Pages. Kardashians before Kim Kardashian, right? Because Kim he Kardashian was the blueprint. Is, exactly, right? Because you, you see what Kylie Jenner and Kris Jenner and whatever the, the Jenner family and the Kardashian family are doing. And you're going, okay, I, you could literally transpose this to Nicole Richie and Paris Hilton in The Simple Life when they were on the farm and when they were uh, doing date or regular people jobs as they were doing in The Simple Life, not in the Hollywood sphere. So. Yeah. Paris Hilton kind of started the sort of celebritism of reality TV shows because before that it was like Survivor, Big Brothers, all those other things. But Paris Hilton was the one who said, OK, we're going to take it. We're going to make money and we're going to show you I'm just a dumb blonde, which she really isn't, and turn it on its head. Yeah, I really respect Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie. Nicole Richie's running a fashion empire and is so fucking smart. I really 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 think that autobiographies before i was never really interested they've kind of always have been it mostly was reserved for political figures but you would get like drew barrymore has one like every once in a while you'd have a couple of celebrities write a, a memoir or an autobiography or whatever but i think with so much of celebrity news being just we're reporting a rumor as fact it's now a great opportunity to say hey here's my story and it's not on like the twitter 140 characters or the Instagram caption, which is whatever, I can tell a 300 page book, my entire story, and you can take it or leave it. So there's a flip side to these biographies as well, because uh, everyone was excited to read Harry, uh, Prince Harry's biography. And I then I'll be I'll be the first to admit I was as well. I was actually looking forward because you want to see the you want to get a peek behind the yeah. curtain, right? But then there's the letdown and there's always the letdown in some of these books, because sometimes you read a book and you go, OK, you didn't you didn't talk about the areas that I thought you were going to talk about because they were the sort of what you were talking about, the TMZs. They were sort of plastered and you you were crafting an image of yourself, which everyone does on social media, but you're crafting an image of yourself. Do you think, though, that books could technically sort of backfire in some sense and say, well, and I know you said political, and I, this is not a political show, but I want to go in my analogy. Bill Clinton wrote his book, My Life, Av during his presidency. Literally one chapter of his entire book, and it wasn't even a chapter, it was half a chapter, was about his uh, affair with Monica Lewinsky. And that was it. And he glossed over what was going on and what led up to it. And everyone was like, well, that didn't, it's not what we wanted. We wanted to know yeah. your side of the story. So- can these books type kind of sort of backfire on celebrities when you want people to get your story, as you say, but sometimes you don't want to talk about the things that people want to talk about? Yeah, that's the that's the thing that I'm kind of noticed as well. Like, because I read um, Tom Felton's autobiography and I felt like he was being too nice. And like, that's the thing with these autobiographies, you have to like, if you're going to do it, and it's not like me looking for like scandalous, like gossip. It's I want you to be honest with with the general population. I think the most honest part of Tom Felton's autobiography, the I think it was the wizard in me or the wand meets the wizard or something like that was the last three chapter, two or three chapters when he talked about his um, alcoholism and substance use and and basically his mental health that was the most honest he had been a lot of it was like i love this person and i love this person and, and like yes that's great that you can talk about these celebrities you had nice moments with but like there's no way in hell you and dan radcliffe didn't fight like there's no way in hell you and rupert grint didn't fight like you were you grew up with these folks like and to sit there and, and you say, were at oh, that age right you were at that age where you were you're 10 13 i 
my friends at 1013 I fought with on a regular basis and yeah. I wasn't in the movie industry. And so like there was so much of it that just felt very like glossed over with Tom Felton's. And I can't, I've started to read Prince Harry's. I've tried multiple times. I've gotten 10 pages in and gone, this is boring. And it's like, what am I doing to capture the attention of the audience? Like Tom Felton's, I finished it. I really liked it. I think it was weaker than like Jeanette McCurdy's, Britney Spears, Elliot Page's. I didn't like the narrative structure of Elliot Page's, but I felt as a whole, it was stronger than Tom Felton's and definitely Prince Harry's because it still was honest. That's what you want is to you want to be honest. And sometimes that means you look like an asshole or you make someone who is still living possibly look like an asshole. If you haven't pissed anybody off, you haven't written a good autobiography. Well, not even that. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't want the salacious details, but be honest, be upfront. Like, like, even if it's like, don't get me wrong. If your presidency is one is defined by a scandal, you talk about that scandal for more yeah. than like a page. But if you have a fight with someone, if you disagree with someone, you you talk about the realities of growing up in the industry, right? Like for Tom Felton, mm-hmm. I like you can imagine. There's probably days where he thought fucking Alan Rickman was an ass. He was probably thought he's probably being a douche to me or a complete asshole to me. Rest his soul. And uh, I can just imagine that he wanted to write that, but then. Do you want to seem like you're slagging people in a book that's about all about you? So there's a line that celebrities have to draw when they're sort of being honest, but being not condescending because people then will have to respond to it. Don't get me wrong. Britney Spears sort of came out with the bombshell that she had an abortion. I did not read any part where uh, that he had, he was playing guitar while she was getting the abortion. And that's horrendous. I don't care who you are. Um, but then Justin Timberlake has to respond. And I don't, I, I, I can't tell you what he, how he responded or how he, ta- uh, how I don't he think mentioned. he has. Well, he, there was some type of thing he talked about. I don't know the exact details, but it seemed, it seems very harsh to say something like that in a negative context, but you need it. But how far do you go? What is the line you can't cross when you're talking about things that are personal? Because as celebrities and you, you, you know this because you lived in Hollywood for some time. Celebrities want their private life. And what happens at parties or what happens with friends, you want to keep that private, just like what happens, like oh, of things that you and I talk about, like I wouldn't want people to know about, but we we chat. And that's the part where celebrities sort of have to draw that line. And I don't know if they figured out the formula to rectify it yet. Well, I don't, I mean, that's the thing. I don't know if necessarily you need to go in and say, like, oh my God this person said this, this, and this, but like, hey, we were at a party and this celebrity tried to sexually assault me. And like, that's important. Like that's things that you should be talking about. Like that's specific moments that are really crucial. And I think that we need more of that and less like what Prince Harry was doing, what Bill Clinton did, what, um, what's another one I read this year? Uh, Tom Felton kind of kind of did but Tom Felton's kind of been off the map for a bit but like you're trying to rehab your image like it's a great way to rehab your image but if you're not going to be honest in it apparently Matthew Perry's autobiography was very honest I've not read it I kind of want to now highly Uh, recommend it highly recommend it because I want to talk about that for a few seconds here and I, I so just to be upfront, um, anyone who knows me, I you know I've been very honest and open about my struggles with addiction, with alcoholism, and with uh, uh, drugs. Uh, I went through a very hard uh, uh, time in my life, and uh, when he when Matthew Perry came out with this book, I, I picked it up, I read it, and I, it really connected with me. And uh, we often say on the show that celebrities' deaths don't often often affect us in negative ways, but this death actually did affect me because. When my husband and I, after you had actually sent it to me, because you were the first one to tell me, you sent it to me. I was like, oh, crap. And then I was trying to figure out what actually happened. Was it an overdose? Was it something else? And while there there doesn't matter if it was an overdose or not, I know the strains that addiction takes on a body. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this, that... um, Addiction comes in many different forms. It it, it, it treats people differently on a day-to-day basis. And people are struggling out there on a day-to-day basis and someone like Matthew Perry to come out and so be so vulnerable in that state because 
even when he was talking about his book, because I, I went back and I watched some of his uh, interviews and one-on-ones that he did on t- late night shows or while he was touring for the book, you could tell that he was having a hard time even acknowledging the fact. And then you read the book and you actually realize that this guy struggled the entire time for 10 years. He portrayed this happy-go-lucky guy on Friends and he was struggling behind the scenes. And that's the true sense that I get that Perry wrote this book. He goes, there was a ghostwriter as well, but he didn't hold back. He told the bad stories. He told that, you know what? I fucked up. I did things wrong. And he talks about days that he was doing drugs and then going and going into talk shows to promote friends. Those are the type of stories I want to know. I want to connect to a celebrity on an emotional level. And Perry was able to weave that thread. I just don't feel like other celebrities have been able to find that yet. Maybe Babs's uh, 998 book uh, page book on her 30, 40 years in uh, uh, the entertainment industry will weave that story, but I highly doubt it. Um, How many pages? 998. Uh, Miss Barbara Streisand. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Miss Barbara Streisand. That's a long ass book. I was considering, I'm like, oh, I should go get, it's almost a thousand pages, ma'am. Well, no, you get, you get, it's not a thousand pages though. It's not a thousand it's pages. It's almost, <laughs> it's two away from being a thousand pages. I'm assuming if you take the inside cover where it says like whatever the book title is in the end credits, it's probably a thousand pages. It's definitely a thousand, like ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, Paris Hilton's book, actually, I'm considering <laughs> running out and buying today because I did not realize it was out. And I, I'm curious. Ahead. No, I'm curious because if she she probably is going to be honest like Britney's and hers. Well, we'll have to check in on that in December when you give us an update on that book. Um, but I want to talk about a book. I Actually, I don't want to talk about a book. You mentioned this, and I, I feel like we're being very... Uh, civil in this first half hour of the segment and i don't know why but i think it's actually been a good conversation well i'm uh, ready for the back half when we talk about Halloween. oh <laughs> that's where we're gonna fight <laughs> ladies and gentlemen get ready for the last half hour of the show but i want to sort of end on this because it was announced in october that uh hugh jackman wolverine himself was going to be releasing or is in the process of writing his memoir which he is going to be his true self or something along those lines. And Michael said, sent me this uh, link and he literally wrote, I need to talk about this period. That was it. So I am handing over the microphone for 10 minutes to Michael to lead us off on the Hugh Jackman uh, memoir. I mean, I I don't need 10 minutes. I can do this one pretty quick. Um, I'm excited for it. Let's see how honest he really is. Um, let's see if he addresses the decades long rumors of him being gay. Um, and if in fact this true self is going to be him coming out because there's, I'm curious. I'm very curious. Like, obviously uh, he said he is straight. We believe that, but there's a lot of like more credible rumors than the Kevin Spacey ones with regards to, like harassment? Not harassment, but just okay. like you, you never use Kevin oh, Spacey. Oh. <laughs> no, I, Kevin Kevin Spacey was just known oh, in, yeah. on in in the sector as being gay. And with Hugh Jackman, it's a much larger pool of people saying, like, no, we have hooked up always consensually. Um, but I'm very curious what this and if this book even talks about it, because like this is also the moment to really define like no, I'm straight. These were all rumors that are being reported as fact or no, actually I'm gay. And this is going to be my coming out letter. Um, So so the reason I say it's going to be 10 minutes, because I I, I was expecting you to go down this line. So I'm going to sort of pose this question. Okay. If a celebrity comes out and says, no, I'm straight in a book and says all these rumors are false. Does that end the rumors though? Probably not, unfortunately, but we have to, we have to take, folks at their word for what they say like yes there's a lot of rumors he has never commented on them and like the rumors are mounting just like kevin spacey would never comment on them but would tell jokes and be like ha 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 well you know how i am and it's like so what so like this is a really perfect opportunity for him to sit there say this is this is my truth this is just 
I'm a straight man in musical theater and y'all don't seem to like to think that I'm straight, but I am. And like, this is a really good point to define that and be on the record defining that. And I do hope he does that, whether it's come out or define, no, I am a straight person. Leave me the hell alone. His title should be leave me the hell alone. Leave Brittany alone is what I wanted hers to be called. Because at, and I think this is where I'm at with that whole situation right now. Because we live in a very flux world, right? We live in a very fluid world where a lot of things just change on a dime. Yeah. I think you I think if he does address it, he's lending credence to the rumors, right? If he says no, I'm straight, he's lending credence to the okay, we've heard what you've talked about. And I understand. And like literally, I was just saying that I wish Bill Clinton would have written a little bit more about the Lewinsky scandal, but when it comes to matters of this, and it, there, there's a there's a line that I think that I, as myself, will not cross with anyone who ever comes on my show or anyone who ever I talk to. I don't care. Uh, like, I don't. There, there are things that I just don't care about. Like, if you are sure. a closeted homosexual, be it. I do not care. If you are bisexual, I don't care. A pansexual, transgender, it doesn't matter to me. Just tell me how I can support you. And that's all I matter. If sure. you say your support is just being, you want to be left uh, as a private individual. I'm comfortable with that. Now I know Perez Hilton, TMZ, that doesn't matter to these people, right? Because surprisingly I have ethics and some people don't shocker, sure. but, but I just, I'm, I, I will actually pick this book up because I'm a very big Hugh Jackman fan. You're a Hugh Jackman fan too. I knew you'd want to talk about this anyways for that reason. <laughs> no, I'm a Hugh Jackman fan since Kate and Leopold with him and Meg Ryan. I think they were the most adorable couple in the history of movies. I think uh, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this, but I'm going in with a sort of a sort of weird perspective saying, if he doesn't talk about it, it's no no big skin off my bad back. Ironic that I say skin off my back because he literally had skin cancer, but here we are. Anyway, don't know why I had to throw that in. I do not know Weird why. Weird segue. <laughs> I <know>. um, <laughs> I'm excited for the book. And I, the number of like big name celebrities like Kate Blanchett that have come forward and said there's so many celebrities in Hollywood men that are big box office names that identify as gay that are scared to come out because they don't know if they'll get roles again. I, I, I really, I, part of me is like, hoping that he is and that he is honest and comes out and still gets work. Cause like Matt Bomer was the next up and coming thing. And then he came out and basically stopped getting work unless they were gay roles. I feel like with Hugh Jackman, he's already had so many prolific roles that like, if we had someone like him or a Tom Cruise or a John Travolta or someone like that were to come out and be like, Hey, I I, I feel like it would just be good for like, normalization of queer men in more masculine style roles because we've talked about this offline about how the general idea of gay men is the stereotype you get and like i feel like a hugh jackman were to come out i think that would do so much positive for the gay community or a celebrity like him that is seen as more masculine and is yeah. pretty beloved. I, I don't know anybody that really hates you, Jackman. I feel like everyone, men and women, just find him attractive, even if they're straight. Because <laughs> it's just like, he's you, Jackman. He's pretty to look at. Okay, you you go there. You, you don't go. think he's pretty to look at? No. <gasps> My heart broke. No, I think him and Ryan Reynolds are overrated in the hot commodity like that's just me like to me hot is hugh grant so i'm sorry but also attractive oh <laughs> the, well the man. accent <laughs> british you, man did, you just like the accent <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't be a show if i didn't get hugh grant in it <laughs> um so hi ken hi barbie hi ken <laughs> Wait, are we here already? We, I, I'm, I'm bringing this right up to the front because we, we. You just want to fight. I, I know because we are so cordial for the last literally thirty five minutes. So I want to sort of be, sort of, uh, uh, I want to fight a little bit. Let's Actually, get ready <laughs> to rumble. So, as everyone knows, in gay culture, Halloween seems to be a priority for a lot of gay people. Me, on the other hand. Hate it. Hate it with a passion. 
I handed out candy to six trick-or-treaters and I heard people walk by my house while I was handing out treats saying, don't go to that house because the old white guy lives there and he's angry at children. So I say this because over the last few weeks, I was really, really apprehensive about Halloween because I know the gay community goes all out in Halloween and God bless them. They can do whatever you want. I go all out for Christmas. I've literally got my Christmas tree already set up. On Halloween, October 31st, 2023, an apocalypse happened. <laughs> an apocalypse of Ken and fucking Barbies from across Canada and around the world. Every politician, every gay couple, every couple went as Ken and Barbie for Halloween this year. And I'm sorry. Originality is lost <laughs> in 2023. Because everyone thought they were being so unique, so cool, so hip by doing Ken and Barbie that they fucking all went as roller skating Ken and Barbie. And I want it to literally scream. I have never hated a movie more after it was released, after I watched it, than I do right now. If Barbie is nominated for any Oscars after this fiasco of Halloween night, I will boycott the Oscars. I will join Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith and their divorce asses or whatever they're called right now and not watch the Oscars for 10 years because of this fucking scandal that happened on October 31st. Ken and Barbie, stop it. Gay community, get some fucking original ideas. It was intentional. It wasn't meant to be everyone's unique. It literally, when the movie came out, everyone said, we are all under the agreement that every single human being in the world is going as Barbie and Ken this year, right? Yep. Like, that was... That I didn't was get the, the fucking was, memo. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to this man, but it was, it was an intentional thing, and it was nobody thinking they were being unique. Everyone saw that movie and went, oh, I can just put clothes on and be Ken and Barbie. It's also an easy Halloween costume for folks. Like, I'm going out to the bar. Oh, um, I'm a Ken or I'm a Barbie. The, insert this. Like, my um, my husband and I were planning on going as Ken and Alan. Uh, but then I couldn't get my shit together with the show to order the Alan shirt because he has that one very iconic rainbow striped shirt that I just never got my shit together to go pick up. So we said, well, who cares? We're grown. But, like... I'm not a big Halloween person. Oh, hold, either, on, so. hold on, hold on. You you said the key word there. You're a grown ass adult. Oh yeah, but if I had the ability to and the attention span to have gotten my shit together, I totally would have gone dressed as Alan. I'm not Halloween shaming. Halloween's not my thing. Um, and I thought the whole Barbie Ken thing was great. I'm just mad that we part of that agreement of all of us going as Barbie and Ken this year was that we were going to do the Barbie dance, and that did not happen. I've seen nobody with all their we're going as Barbies group, no one has done the Barbie dance. And so I'm over here disappointed because I was promised the second half of this and I never got it. Wow, you are the only angry white man that hates children. <laughs> Barbie's gonna get nominated for things. I'm just forewarning you. And if it does, if it gets nominated for costumes, I am literally picking every other nominated fucking uh, uh, film against Barbie. Because if Barbie wins for costumes... Those I... costumes were incredible! They were! I need you to get your... blocked. I need to get blind for this because, you know, I need to make sure I say this correctly. How crazy are you that you thought those costumes were original, fantastic, great, and even nom Oscar nominated worthy because they were the most horrendous, over cheap, overproduced fucking costumes I have ever seen in my life? Barbie was a horrible movie. And I say that now, and I say that with pride. Barbie, if you get nominated, don't get me wrong. Do not get me wrong. I like the story. I like the idea of the story. I like the concept of the story. 
I did not like Ryan Gosling. I did not like Margot Robbie. I did not even like Will Ferrell. And I'm a big Will Ferrell fan. I did not like the movie. I think it is probably a 5 out of 10 at best. If we were still doing Night at the Movies, I would probably have given a 1 out of 5 stars. So, please, Academy. Um, I know you're going through issues right now with the writer str- or the actor strike. Maybe just don't hold an Oscars in 2024. Maybe I'll, I'd be okay with that. Just ignore what happened in 2023. Give everything to like Oppenheimer or give everything to, I don't know, Mission Impossible Part 1, Movie 7. Maybe give uh, uh, Tom Cruise his Academy Award for this year. Just do not, for the love of me, please. I, I'm praying on my deathbed right now. I could be dying. I am dying. I have a tumor in the back of my head. It is growing. Do not nominate Barbie for any awards this year. And please, for the love of God, stop the insanity and have some original ideas here, gay people. Show me on the bear figurine where Barbie hurt you. Show me on the bear figurine where Barbie hurt you. Right in my head. <laughs> wow. I don't have such strong opinions about Barbie. Do I think it was not the strongest movie? Sure. Um, do I think that the costumes did what they needed to do and were actually brilliant? I'm sorry. I do. I And I'm a costume kind of hoe. You know me. I, I always, that's one of my, f- that's one of the most important parts of storytelling, I feel, is the costuming. And I felt it did what it needed to do. And it was recreations of the dolls those costumes were perfect recreations of the dolls clothes i'm sorry i it's gonna get nominated for at least costumes it might not get anything else but it it, if it doesn't get costumes i do think that there's something wrong in the world i I don't know if it necessarily should win but that's because i haven't seen everything else i think it's gonna get nominated for production design yeah, that Barbie world was actually pretty brilliantly designed too. That was again a perfect recreation of yeah. the things. Um, I'm There's... curious how it does of uh, uh, in other areas. I haven't seen everything that's. I I have not seen much of what's been nominated. That'll be my January February plans as you as I always do. But can we talk about Oscar season for a second here? Sure. On honest question. And this, I was thinking about this when I was preparing for what we potentially would be talking about. Usually Oscar season kicks off November. Yes. Usually you start seeing the movies that are going to be nominated November, December. Traditionally, though, you see a big push from actors and actresses doing the rounds on these uh, uh, late night TV shows, the daytime talk shows, talking about their movies to get people hyped up to go out and see them. Um. Could this, and I, I know we keep on talking about the register of this actor strike, but I think it's an important uh, concept in the entertainment world right now. Do you think the ongoing SAG actra strike could affect this year's nominee pool? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, because there's a lot of movies that have been pushing back, right? There's a lot of movies that are like, okay, we're going to release in January. Or we're going to release next May or next fucking October. It doesn't seem like there's, like I was looking at the December lineup. I was like, there doesn't seem like there's that many like potential Oscar nominees that could be coming out of here. I think what you're going to end up seeing is folks looking back in March, if, especially if, folk, if they're pushing movies towards like the newer year, you're going to see things happen where like Chevalier, which came out in March, April, something like that. Um, the Lost King or the there's something like it was a uh, Sally Hawkins from the Shape of Water. She had a movie where she was like looking for the missing king that came out in March. There's going to be, I think, a ton of movies that would just be overlooked because now we've lowered the amount of things vying for slots because they're looking at the next year. I think you're going to see a lot more incredible movies that get overlooked because they came out later in the year. Um, I also think you paved the way for more things that were 
bigger box office successes to maybe slot into a couple of areas that would have just been overlooked because of all the different things. But we're also like, maybe we'll see a, a horror resurgence. A lot of the horror movies have been banging this year. Talk to me, which was the one with the hand has been, inc- was incredible. And it's, I, I, you're not a big horror person, are you? I, I I watch it. It's not my favorite genre, but I will watch it. I did watch a few that came out in October. I did watch Saw 10, which I thought, yeah. I don't well, like the I, Saw movies. I, I, I like the first few because I thought they were unique and sort of different from the traditional slasher films. And then it just got like off the rails. I was like, okay. And then I watched this because you know how you follow through on something? Like you, you get so committed to something and you watch the first like eight and you're like, they're so bad, but I have to continue if they continue to produce them. Like the Halloween movies, right? For a while there, they were producing shit. Halloween H2O. Uh, and it was just horrible movies. And then the last three movies were they actually redeemed themselves they did well even with scream scream is not a perfect uh like group of movies but they did do a few good ones i didn't i don't think scream six was good i think it was horrible uh the new york one whatever you want to call it but i think five was okay i think four shit three even worse two probably one of the betters and one was good because it was actually the first of the many um I didn't think the horror film franchise this year did, or the horror films of this year, maybe I didn't see all of them. Like I know uh, the reckoning or the something, and I forget her name right now. And I can oh, they had it. the new exorcist. Yes. The exorcist. And there was a lovely old uh, actress uh, and I can't remember her name right now. Uh, she's in it and it was semi good, but then there was the nun two that came out or the nun five. I yeah. liked the nun two. I, I think it was better than the first one. No, but I'm talking about the a 24 stuff, which you, we talk about a 24 all the time. Cause they're just setting the bar for good movies. They're indie films, they're small production, but they're good. And I think that their horror films this year have been knocked out of the park incredible that I would love to see that. Or maybe we'll see comedies finally get a chance. Like there's so many great comedies that just always get overlooked at the academies. I think we're going to, if anything, if it really has an effect, I think we might see things from earlier in the year and comedies have maybe a resurgence, which we need more of that. God, watching 45 movies with three of them being good because the rest are all drama and make me want to jump off my roof like i can't i need some fun i need some whimsy um a24 is quite good right now they've kind of been in the news lately for the last few weeks because they've been getting uh sort of uh uh uh, uh, i don't know the uh, agreements with the sag actra to continue some of the production so they're still in production because it seems like they actually pay their actors quite well so there you go (laughs) yep and like that's also i'm like support a24 (laughs) like there's a reason they have a green light to do that work right now it's because they're they're walking the walk and talking the talk and like they're really making sure that the content is they're putting out is quality while working with it's they tend to take a lot of unknown smaller name actors and actresses too which is really cool um i'm just cautious of time here and we're almost at the hour mark we're at 50 minutes now and i still got a few what's wrong oh i think we started late so i think we're not at the hour i don't even think we're Uh close Okay, well, if you want to continue talking, let's continue talking. Um, I want to talk about what you've seen over the last few months, over the last month, or in our case, last almost three weeks since the last time we actually sat down and chatted because you've been busy, I've been swamped, and we really haven't had much time to actually sit down and chat. So this is unfiltered, everyone. You're about to hear how <laughs> Mike and I actually talk to each other via text on a daily basis and go, what the fuck was that? I don't know what the fuck that was. So what have you seen? Because I know there's one uh, particular movie that you were very not impressed with because the actor that you were hoping to be in it was not in it. What was the movie? Oh, it's the TV show, the television program. I literally, literally was, my husband's like, do we want to watch The Fall of Usher? And I said, yeah. Me thinking it was the a documentary series about Usher. So I'm like, I didn't know he had like a fall that was public. I know I've been doing a lot of theater and like off, right, off the fucking radar in the woods for like the last four or five months, but this is quick when did he have his fall 
we start watching it. I'm like, what is this? What's this? This where's Usher? My husband goes, what do you mean? I go, Jonathan, where's Usher? And he goes, this is about Edgar Allan Poe and it's Edgar Allan Poe's stories. And I'm like, but Usher? I, listen, I, I don't, I don't really fucks with Edgar Allan Poe. I know he's the Raven. And there's the one where you put the little heart in that that might still be the Raven where they put the heart in the floorboards. <laughs> like I'm, I know Edgar. I just don't know his whole life story and his literary work. Just like I know like other things. So I wouldn't think the fall of Usher was about Edgar Allan Poe. I would think it was about uh, pop singer Usher. But was it good? I've watched uh, two and a half episodes. I It's actually really fucking phenomenal. <laughs> uh, it's the people who wrote- Maybe um, Usher makes an appearance at the end. Fucking I hope so. Um, <laughs> Just to prove your husband wrong. <laughs> it's the people who did The Haunting of Hill House. And um, The Haunting of Hill House and the one that was about the vampires last year that had the really good script. Twilight? No, it's a really good script. <laughs> Twilight was, 2? No, stop. Simmer down. Twilight Eclipse? I can't stand you. Um, no, Twilight was, Breaking but Breaking Dawn Part 1? What was that? It had the kid from E.T. in it. I don't know. I don't watch things anymore. I am so busy. Like I feel like, like you watched this television program, Midnight Mass. It's oh, actually... oh yes, 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 yes. It was like a like three episode or six episode show, and it was only one season. It was really yeah, okay. And the script was incredible, but like the special effects makeup, yikes! <laughs> that old aging makeup they did, which was a practical effect, which I do love. Yikes, though. Like that, I watched. I like the Nun too. I said I, I thought it was a lot better than the first one. It's still. It's still the Conjuring universe. I love the Conjuring universe. And I think that the first two Conjurings were incredible. And then the spinoffs have been okay. But like, it was really a better script and better acted. I think they got rid of the weak link from the first one. And they found new writers for it. But like, I was supposed to go see The Exorcist. I didn't get there. Um, I feel like there's a couple of other things. Oh, I saw the... What's it? The, the the new Poirot? The Haunting in Venice? Oh, enough champagne to fill the Nile? No, but she wasn't in it. it this one was good. Yeah, but Tina Fey. Yeah, Tina Fey. I, I literally left that and I went, this was really good and Tina Fey was there. Um, She should not act in she should dramas. Not, she, there you go. I think she's a good writer. I think she's a good act, uh, comedy actress because she was good in Baby Mama and 30 Rock, but I, I agree yeah. with you. Um, that it is not something I'm just looking at what has come out in the last month because I don't even remember if I've actually seen anything. Uh, didn't see that, didn't see that, didn't see that, didn't see that, <laughs> did not see that. Uh, really did not see that. What uh, What have you not seen? Uh, Dumb Money with uh, Paul Dano, Pete Davison, Vincent D'Onofrio, American Ferrero, Nick Offerman. It's about like cryptocurrency and all that shit. Oh. Uh, uh, where's the other one? Expendable my... Four, I didn't see. Spy Kids Armageddon, I didn't see. My husband like bodies. Don't know what that is. So that is um the, it's a television show about three three or four time periods where each time period all of a sudden there's a new body that it's the same body over these like four different time periods and it's detectives trying to solve this murder basically but they're not they're all from like 1700s 1800s 2007 and then like 2058 or something like that it's the same body though so okay it's like this time loop thing i don't know he really liked it i was like this looks like a you show and not a me show so i'm gonna go to bed so he watches that when I'm not. Speaking of A24 for a second, I'm actually surprised you didn't haven't mentioned this coming up because you are our entertainment Broadway critic and you are our Broadway aficionado. And that is Dick's the Musical based on Pass. the off-Broadway. You don't want to see it? I have no interest. Is it bad? 
no, I just have no interest. It just looks like it looks like something that's not my style of humor. Okay, so you and didn't see I, it off Broadway. No, and so if I don't see it, I don't have to have an actual formed opinion um, on the show. True, but the cast looks incredible. Yeah, Megan Mullally. Did you watch the Taylor Swift Eras tour in uh, in theater, or did you go to the mini concert in every theater across Canada or America as well? Um, I did not. I had a coworker who went, and she literally was like, "My theater was boring. Nobody sang in their seats. Nobody did like dancing in the aisles." And I'm like, "I was watching like cult circles forming at these things from the TikToks." I'm like, "I don't know. No, no." Um, we started Loki. Yeah, we did. We started that as well. Uh, it, we've got like two episodes in. We still we we've just been. We have literally not stopped. We haven't had time where my husband's and my schedule have matched up to sort of work together and be able to sit down. And we're hoping tonight we'll be able to catch up on a few things because there's a lot that we are trying to catch up on because we just started the rookie, which Nathan with Nathan Fillion. So, oh, really, Jonathan really liked that. Yeah, we're really getting into that right now. I don't know why, but maybe it's because Nathan Fillion's from uh, Alberta, which we are, uh, we are from as well. So. Yay. Um, I want to talk about a movie that has come out and has been causing some sort of uh, controversy a little bit. And that is the movie Priscilla, which is the uh, a biography on Priscilla Presley, who was Elvis's wife, uh, then got divorced. Um, it had it has come out that prior to Priscilla's passing earlier this year, uh, there was uh, reports and this is all reports and I cannot confirm because I'm only reading what is being reported in the media that she was not happy with the portrayal of the, sh- uh, the movie and how she sort of comes off and how the family comes off. Uh, so I, I, it's one movie that I'm actually, I'm not a hundred percent sure if I'm going to go see, but I probably want to go see because I think it's, it's always interesting to see the woman side of the story as well. It is directed by Sofia Coppola, who is well known for, and speak of the devil, also produced by A24 as well. Shocker. <laughs> because God, yeah. for, God forbid. And it's based on the uh, uh, Priscilla Presley's actual biography as well. And for those who are wondering, Jacob Alordi, I don't know who this is, is, and he's in Euphoria. It plays Elvis Presley. There you go. Yeah, I'm I'm curious about this movie. Um, I'm also hesitant because uh, Austin Butler did an incredible job. And I don't know if Jacob Alardi is going to do as incredible a job um, just because of how high the bar Austin Butler set. Also, it kind of feels icky when the woman that this is supposed to be about is like, I don't like the portrayal of myself and my ex-husband in this film. That's kind of a big yikes for me, but maybe they made some changes. Maybe once it's finally released, people will feel differently. Um, I just also think that like the Elvis hype feels a little grabby for awards whereas because that Elvis movie came out and every single person all of a sudden became invested in the Academy Awards because they liked Elvis and they liked that movie and it got so many many of which I did not feel it deserved it only took away like two or three did it, it not or even... none I, I got none yeah I, I got none that's what I thought um and people were pissed over it and it's like well hold on let's not act like this movie was life-changing yeah and and so I feel like this might be A24's little Oscar grab that might not be or or Oscar buzz movie to try and get folks to come and see their stuff more frequently. But I don't know. I don't know anything. I've not seen it. It might be the best movie of the year. And I'm talking on my ass right now. You talk out your ass? Never on this show there, Michael. <laughs> I feel we both do. Don't come for me. Wow, I never, I come with informed opinions and the truth on my side every single time. I don't care who you are, I know what I know. And uh, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Um, oh, The Gilded Age, that's season two started. I really like The Gilded Age. I don't know, if did you watch season one? I don't know what it is. It's um, 
about the Gilded Age in New York, and it's like no it's... shit. <laughs> Just like the fall of Usher is about Usher, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's Christine Baranski. Um, it's, oh yes, upstate New York, and they're like it's yes, like really well done. Yes, I do remember. They this. filmed this, that in Troy. Half my friends are in the background of those scenes, and this is sort of like the American version of Bridgerton, isn't it? Because that's how they're kind of portraying it. Downton Abbey. Okay, I thought it was Bridgerton that they were trying to sort of coalesce, but Downton Abbey. It, it, basically the same thing to be it's fair. basically the same thing <laughs> but like it's it's not so much romance as it is like period drama um so it's more because Downton Abbey had like the romance features but it was more period drama than Bridgerton which is like you're building up to the sex um you haven't talked about Wheel of Time I was just trying to figure out if it had come out and it has it did, did yeah did you watch season two I did. Oh, I did watch season two. Good, bad, better than the first? Because you read the books, right? I'm in the process of reading the books. They're 80 All years 19... long. <laughs> There's <laughs> 400 of them. So just think of this, for those who are wondering, there are about 14 versions of Barbara Streisand's books. <laughs> yes. And certain portions of them feel like they put two of Barbara Streisand's books into one 200-page section. Or in the event of books seven through 10, which I've been told, it becomes awful. I, so I'm on, I have book three that I have to start and I keep going, mm, let's put it at the bottom of this book pile. Oh no, I bought more books. I got to put it on top of this one. <laughs> I'll get to it. I'm very behind on my reading goal right now. And so well, it's not like they're making like, season three anytime soon. No, <laughs> it's going to take them a few fucking years. So I yeah. should be like four or five books in by the time season three comes out in six years. Um, It was all right. The TV show, the television program. Um, Now that I've read the books. They I, take a I, lot of liberties, eh? They take so many liberties. And, and that's like, why I could not get into the first season. The first season, I was just like, oh, this is not how things are supposed to go. And then you're like, what the fuck are you doing? And as an originalist who likes books, who reads the books before watching things, I I, I, I sat there and I was cringing the entire time. But maybe I season two was better. I'm not such an originalist. I, I just, I feel like with aspects of it, they're trying to they're trying to make the story their own so that if you've read the books, you can watch the TV show and know the direction you're going, but still get all twists and turns thrown at you. I also feel like there's certain actors and actresses that they like working with that aren't as featured in the books or aren't there very long that they're trying to like twist and turn. I think the biggest season two moment came with, or the season two, it was when we killed, uh, Uno. Okay. And then Lord Ingtar didn't have the reveal. So I'm like, this, what? Like, what? there were wait, moments, whoa. like, hold on. Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there was a, no that's reveal. A... Yeah. There was no, like, I fucked up and I'm going to rehab my soul by this sacrifice. He just sacrificed himself. Jeff Bezos, please report to the office. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, please report to the office. But like um, the domain storyline was really great. Yeah. They're kind of butchering Min's character right now. Oh, are they? And they introduced um the IL woman. I can't remember her name. She's in book three, so I've not officially met her in the books, but they introduced her in season two. So they're basically taking liberties. They've read all 14 books and they're like, okay, how can we make 14 books this. In into five seasons? Because after five seasons, no one watches this type of shit anymore. They don't want to become Game of Thrones. So they're like, yeah. how can we blow through this? But, but Okay, but you cannot compare the two though. And I hate to say this because you cannot compare the two because George R.R. R. R. Martin did not complete his book series part of nope. the time. And that's what fucked them over. Because mm -hmm. I think if Georgia, if they would have waited until all the books were released, they would have had a better chance of writing a better season seven. 
with this, you have 14 books. You would literally have, I think it's actually 15, if I'm not mistaken, if you talk, yeah. if, if you take in the prequel and the like sort of side quest books as well. But you have some pretty extensive, and I say, say extensive, like you have a whole fucking world laid out in front of you for 14 yeah. books. So you know exactly where you're going to. So you know A to Z. No, there's no ambiguity anywhere in the storyline. But if you start diverting and go A, B, J, C, W, D, then it gets really confusing. And for those who want to follow along with the book, who are so big fans of Wheel of Time, you start destroying the structure. And I understand that this is not for them. These are not this. this, this Yeah, it's not for that. It's for the people who are looking for the next Game of Thrones. I just I'm very apprehensive. Um, I will say from reading the first two, and I'm sure you can agree, there's a lot of we're just walking and nothing happens. Oh, you it's worse easily, than fucking The Hobbit. <laughs> you could easily have stuck two of those books into one eight episode season and followed them pretty verbatim and just cut out all the we're walking and nothing's happening. And we're talking to a friend and he's saying, hello, friend. And then we're walking again. And now we're staying on the farm and hi, nice farm people. And then we're walking like, but, yeah, but here's the thing that though. out. But this was th- these were written in the eighties and nineties, right? Oh, so yeah, these, these were written when people actually read that type of shit, right? Now, if you write anything about someone walking and talking, you better have a TikTok version of it because no one is going to have the attention span of a fucking uh, gnat because they just want the next thing. There are I some dialogues in the first two books when they're walking and talking that actually do progress the storylines in future books. So it may oh, not for look sure. like. So that's where you have to sort of be appar- you have to sort of cut without cutting. We have just gone on a tangent today. Haven't but like we? also <laughs> I don't agree with that cuz like there's Brian Sanderson writes like 1000 page books and has his own giant universe storyline thing going and he doesn't have a lot of that extraneous. Like there's ways to like have conversations where it propels the story forward in later books while at the same time not having 300 pages of a book where nothing has happened nothing literally nothing and i've read the first two and i can easily cut out four or five hundred pages from the first two where nothing has occurred but flowery dialogue and like light character development light can, can, can we come back after you read barbara streisand's book and see if we if, can cut it through <laughs> if, if i read it if i read it um well, there you go. This is the book show, eh? No I, longer. <laughs> I, because my book club fell apart, I just want a book club. So I'm glad that we discussed <laughs> books this whole time. I got my whole year's worth of book club in this one moment. And you have just named the, the show's title. <laughs> I just want a book club. Maybe that's what we should start. The No Not Them book club of 2024. Um. I want to talk about, well, I actually don't want to because I don't even know anything about this. I've never heard of it, and you have, and you're like, we need to talk about it because it is glorious. Glory to the highest gods and the Zeus and the Aphrodite. But um, That doesn't sound like me. Not one bit. <laughs> let's talk about House of Villains. What's this all about, and why is it so fascinating for you? So, okay, House of Villains was all the reality TV show villains you could think of in one like reality competition reality competition to be the baddest villain of all of reality TV. Now let me tell y'all where this television program fucked up. They got rid of Tiffany, New York Pollyard, two episodes in. That bitch Don't is know who that is. She was on Flavor of Love. Don't know who that is. Flavor Flav? The guy with the big clock? He goes, Flavor Flav! You don't know Flavor Flav? I feel like he was like a 90s, 2000s cultural icon that like I avoided and still knew about. I know of Flavor Flav. I just don't yeah. know if he had a reality TV show. Yeah, he had a, a um I thought he was on that I thought he was on that only the on that one show, like the surreal life of 
B actors or something where Tammy Lee Faye and like Rick James and all those sort of unknown peoples were on and they were put into a house for three weeks and they had to survive by doing challenges that were like normal people challenges. And that's where we're like Rick James, the Rick, uh, I think it's Rick James, the porn star and Tammy Lee Faye were like BFFs the entire time. And he was talking about fucking women. And she was like, I fuck God. God's amazing. Um, Flavor, it was called Flavor of Love. He had a reality show to fall in love. And is Tiffany, that where tequila, tequila something? Te- no, that was Tequila Tequila Shot at Love, which was another reality television program. Um, but now she's gone full like QAnon. So she's a little psycho. Um, okay, continue sorry, on about me. Flavor Flav and then so, Nicole Richard or Simmons and Simmons Richard. Tiffany Pollard. I got so close. Tiffany, Bye. Tiffany New York was on. Flavor, Flavor of Love, Flavor. the first season. She lost. She was one of the final two girls. They brought on a second season because apparently the first time his Flavor of Love didn't happen. So we needed a second season. So they brought her on. Like, nobody was really watching it. They brought her on episode four or five. And then she ended up becoming a contestant again and made it to the final, like, two again because she's good reality TV. And, like, she is good reality tv she basically she was on celebrity big brother in the uk uh with Gemma collins which has like some of the most iconic moments but this bitch knows how to read for filth like read for filth i'll have to send you some videos after so you can see because she's unhinged but she makes good reality tv and okay. she's on this uh it's the house of villains it has omarosa on there um uh, it has like she is a t- TV reality villain. So Tiffany's up and for elimination. And former White House staffer, but anyway. She's up for elim- elimination. And uh, she looks at Omarosa. Omarosa looks at her and goes, well, how are you going to earn my vote? And Tiffany Pollard looks at her and goes, I don't want your pity vote, you come guzzling cunt whore. But like starts going off on this woman. And everyone's like, you need her vote to stay. And New York's, I don't give a fuck. Like, it's such a great TV show, but you have the like self, not even self-described, like the world-described self-producer of reality TV, the reason people watch reality shows, gone after episode two. You cannot, cannot sit there and say that that's not, that that's a good idea. Like she's entertainment, but they have like all these different reality villains on there. It's kind of interesting. Just pulling up Jax Taylor, Tiffany, New York Pollard, Tanisha yeah. Thomas, Shaki Chatterjee, Omarosa. Um, Tanisha ahead. Thomas was the girl that said, I don't give a fuck about y'all with the pans, that meme. Yeah, I've literally, oh, Johnny Fairplay, I know him. Uh, yeah, Johnny Fairplay, we don't like Johnny Fairplay. Why not? Because he is a, is, he's bad. Um, and Johnny Bananas, we also. Is it, is it literally the whole show about being bad? Yeah, but it's and like they literally were like, "Oh, Tiffany, New York, you are you're not a bad villain. You're not the baddest villain, so you got to go." And everyone's like, mm. "No, they got rid of her because she was gonna win, but they got rid of her too early because now nobody wants to watch their television program." So, and of course, Joe McHale is well. The, he's the host. He's the host of that. Dear God, that man can host anything just for a paycheck, eh? Yeah, it's the first two episodes were great because. New York basically ran around, screamed at everybody, like caused all the drama and like made it entertaining to watch. Cause like, if I'm going to watch a show about people who are the drama, I want people, I want the biggest drama to be there the whole time fighting with people. But some people are just like, uh, anyway, <laughs> it like Omarosa should have gone. It is not my wheelhouse. Who was she up against? Um, I don't remember. It was some man. It may have been Johnny Fairplay. No, Anafisa. Oh, I don't know Anafisa. She is from Ninety Day Fiance Four. He's God forbid <sighs> we need fucking four episodes, four seasons of Ninety Day Fiance. There's like twenty. I know. I was looking at Discovery Plus last night because my favorite show is back, and I'm so excited as of Tuesday. What's your favorite uh, show? Holiday Baking Championship. Oh, I thought yeah, that was the one you wanted. Yes, so I'm very the, I'm very happy for you. If I would have just looked at the news releases from Food Network, I would have realized that they announced it two months ago, and I just wasn't paying attention because no one had said anything about it. 
So maybe Chris should do his research before he flies off the hinge. Oh, maybe I should have done that before I flew off the hinge about Barbie and Ken. Ah, eh. Ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, we are now at the end of the show and I say it is time to say it is Christmas. It is Christmas season. Uh, God bless us. Every single one of us. Mariah Carey has come out of her hole and we have eight weeks of Christmas, Christmas music, Christmas cheer, and good old Christmas movies from the Hallmark Channel to rely on. Um, what are you up to over the next few weeks until our next sit down in middle of December? Um, uh, fucking nothing. It's kind of incredible. Um, I really don't have anything on the books other than you said your birthday. Well, my, we normally go to the city for my birthday, but the place we stay, they're getting the bathrooms redone. And so we may not be able to go, which if that's the case, I'm just going to rescind my vacation at work because I don't want to use vacation time to sit at home. And I'm not going to go to New York and pay $300 a night at hotels on top of also seeing shows and paying lots of money to see shows. So I'm kind of at that point where I'm like, if I can't go in December, I might look at January. So I might do like a weekend trip where I like drive into the city on a Saturday, see a couple of shows and then drive home. Anything coming um, out that you want to see in Broadway? Uh, I have a long list of things. Um, Spam a lot's coming out or coming Who's back. Who's in it this That's, year? Uh, a lot of Broadway names. Michael Yuri from Ugly Betty's in it. Um, Alex Brightman, who's, I think he's won the Tony or he's at least been nominated three or four times. He's in it. Um, James Monroe Engelhart's in it. Like it's uh, Leslie Kritzer. She's phenomenal. Like there's a lot of really good names in that one. Danny DeVito has his play with his daughter that I'd like to see. Um, Cabaret with Eddie. That's not coming out till the spring. Oh, okay. So there's a couple of stuff that's not coming out till the spring, but there's a ton of really great shows. Um, I want to see shark is broken, but that's going to be closed by the time we get to the city so i if we decide not to go to if we decide not to do or we can't go for my birthday i may go early to try and catch the shark is broken before it shutters what's the show that daniel radcliffe and jonathan groff are in merrily we roll along which i also really want to see i've been hearing great things about it it's one of those shows when it came out it lasted six days on broadway or no 48 hours something like that a very short time it flopped because it and then now it's aged over time and people are like wait no this show's actually really great and so that happens sometimes the color purple same way it really did not do well its first time around second time around though it was phenomenal and it picked up tons of awards because it just needed some time to age and to work out the kinks like some shows you they go in and they do too much with it and it just isn't doesn't work out or they don't do enough and then when they come back, they do more with it and it works out. It's one of the, it's very weird the way revivals work. Sometimes the revivals can just be more, a better version than the original. Melissa Etheridge's My Window is Closing on November 19th. Yeah, God I don't care about that one, sadly. Because she's a um, lesbian, isn't it? No, it's because you... it's a one woman show and I'm not paying $300 to watch one woman do any kind of show. The shark is broken. November nineteenth, it closes. Cl Shucked is closing. So Shucked is closing, but it's going on a national tour, and we all we are thinking it might be moving to off Broadway because it's cheaper and it can run forever if it goes to off Broadway. Okay. So I'm um, like, it hot is closing. I don't care as much to see that, but I do want to see Back to the Future. I really still want to see Sweeney Todd and I'd like to try and see it before they ruin it by putting Aaron Tveit in it. Um, Gutenberg, the musical, I really want to see. Yeah, I was uh, just looking at that. I was like, "Who? what's that all about? So it's a two-person show, but it's the two folks that were the original um, Book of Mormon guys. It's a show oh. about Johannes Gutenberg and making a musical based on Johannes Gutenberg, but it's like a comedy. Josh Gad and Andrew Reynolds. I yeah. like those two. I think they're actually really good together. I want to see Barry Manilow's musical Harmony. 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 All it's, I can about, think of, 
Anytime someone says uh, Barry Manilow, all I can picture is Debbie Reynolds and Will and Grace on the corner. <laughs> I told you so. Told you so. Told you. Told you. Told you so. <laughs> Don't know why, but Barry Manilow and Debbie Reynolds are synonymous in this gay head. <laughs> right here. Um, right that's here. a fair. That's fairly. That's a good synonymous for them to be. I know. <laughs> Um, uh, it's a musical about the Holocaust and about these comedic singing tenors. It's a sad oh, show, actually. <laughs> that should have said that before I fucking went into my <laughs> told you so rant. Fuck. Um, I want to see Here Lies Love, which is the Imelda Marcos story. Um, Pearly Victorious, a non-Confederate romp through the cotton patch. Uh, that's a play. I think that's the play. Or is that the musical? They have two versions of it. Um, I need that's the Danny DeVito one. Who's in Chicago these days? Any big names or are they sort of mm, slowing down? Nobody at the moment. Um, oh, True. is Doubt officially released its start? Oh, it's February. I'm excited for that one. That's Tyne Daly and Lee Schreiber. Um, is, yeah, is there's that not ba- a. Is that the like movie version of or the Broadway version of the movie? or? The well, movie? it was a Broadway version first. Oh, was it? Okay. Um, there's a ton of stuff that's coming out later in the year that I want to see this right now. There's not much on Broadway that's or even you, off Broadway that we want to see. You're c- kicking down the doors. Huh? Anyway, uh, what about what, uh, what besides that? You're sort of just relaxing and kicking back these days. Yeah, not much to do, which is good. I'm taking a bit bit of a break before I have a couple of projects kicking around that might happen in mid to late winter but other than that i have nothing scheduled set which is good because it gives time to plot scheme and plan for my own takeover of things in the area (laughs) all the wine to fill the nile um i want to thank you it's always a pleasure to sit down with a critically acclaimed director and just chat about the ongoing issues of books and not the entertainment industry as we it was kind a quiet of month. it was well we've only we we were only away for two weeks right because we, like it seems like a month but we we didn't record we recorded our last episode on the uh, 9th of uh october so it's only been two almost two months two weeks three weeks since we last chatted so it was quite a few weeks uh we'll probably be about six weeks until the next one because you have your birthday i will have a few things that i have to do in december so we won't probably be talking until the end um but it's always a pleasure to sit down with you it's always a pleasure to chat with you um it's always a pleasure to uh shoot the shit with you and just talk about the entertainment as only two people who aren't the people you are thinking of only can this is no not them look at that one time fucking right i'm I'm so shocked so proud of you